Morning, glory, and hallelujah. Grace and peace be to you. Today I want to talk to you about integrity. Are you the kind of person who is trustworthy? When you say you're going to do something, do you do it? Are you the kind of person that believes that the Ten Commandments are the right way to live? Only on Sunday? When you say yes, does it mean yes? Or does it mean yes, as long as nothing better comes along? <laughs> During the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus referenced keeping one's word, meaning that we should have integrity. Jesus said, this is Matthew 5, 33 and following. Again, you've heard that it was said that people long, by people long ago, or two people long ago, do not break your oath or your promises, but keep the oaths or promises you've made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Jesus, of course, is the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot e make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. When Jesus says not to swear in this context, he means that we should not have to add in degrees, degrees, to what we are saying so that people know that we're serious. If I say I will do something, then I should be trusted that it will get done. I shouldn't have to clarify. I, I will do it, and if I don't, you can stick a thousand needles in my eye. Ow. <laughs> or I shouldn't have to say, I swear on my grandmother's grave, or something like this. Shouldn't have to do it. The people in our church family and the people of the world should know of our reputation as people who say we are going to do something and we follow through. If we cannot follow through, the assumption should always be that there was an emergency because we are people of integrity. Our yes means yes and our no means no. Should our words mean something different depending on the context? Let me give you an example. If I say to Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the Messiah, the coming one, the Christ. Jesus, you are the one that God has sent to rule the world and my heart. You are the one who saved me from my sin and the death that sin was leading me toward. You, Jesus, are my Savior. Should I then live a life that is hypocritical to these statements? We know that Jesus says that he came to fulfill the law in Matthew 5, 17. We know that Jesus would not want us to break God's commandment, thou shalt not steal. So should we ever steal? I'm not talking about accidentally putting a pen in your pocket that didn't belong to you. If you've done this and realize it, just go give it back. I'm talking about setting out to steal. I'm, I'm talking about, uh, you know, Ocean's Eleven. They set out to steal. You know, people considering how it should be done before they execute their plan to steal. If we are a people of integrity, should we ever steal? What if you find yourself hungry and without food? Should you set out to steal food so that you will survive? Many have struggled with this moral dilemma. Many would not blame the child who did so. But what about the adult? I think many try to rationalize this sort of situational ethics with such a question. But the problem is that they leave God out of the predicament. How big is your God? We need to trust God. When I was in Bible school in Los Angeles, I had the opportunity to work as a youth leader with a Spanish-speaking church. No, I, I, I didn't know Spanish well. However, the kids wanted to speak English anyways. The pastor of the church and I had become friends at college. He was a professor and I was a student. And he asked me if I was interested in driving him and his wife to several places in Mexico 
where he was evangelizing. Melinda and I were very interested. As a result, we were able to march for Jesus in Tijuana and enjoy the coast of Baja, California. And that's, that's pretty nice. Melinda and I were really enjoying these trips and the good work that was being done in sharing Jesus' gospel. Uh, I remember I almost left my car in the back hills of Ensenada. The roads are pitched pretty uh, steep there. <laughs> so we enjoyed sharing the gospel. One day the evangelist told us while we were in Mexico that his wife had a serious heart condition. And the medicine was too much money in the United States, so they had purchased it from a Mexican pharmacy. He told me to lie to the United States Border Police as we re-entered our country. Now, I was very uncomfortable with this. I, I am a man of integrity. I know that God does not want me to lie. I also know that God does not want this very sweet woman to die because she cannot get her heart medicine. Should I lie? I did not have a lot of time to think through this, but what I believed is that God could make this work. I did not have to throw my ethics away or out the window. How big is your God? God was bigger than the situation and he could do something that I was not aware of. I really could not control the situation, but I knew that God could. My role was to be a man of integrity and not lie. However, I also I'm a man of prayer, and I could ask God to be merciful to this woman. We arrived at the border, and the border guard asked me if we had any medical substance that we should not. And I said to him, very matter-of-factly, we have purchased some medicine from a Mexican pharmacy for the woman in the car with a heart condition. It is too expensive in the States, and she could die without it. The border guard was surprised. I don't think many people ever listen to his questions. He asked me to repeat some of what I said. I, I did not ask him for mercy, but my demeanor demonstrated that I believed it was right for her to have the medicine. I also showed everyone in the car that I did not believe that it was right to lie. We need to trust God. I do not believe the evangelist did at the time. The guard led us through. We were unchecked. Why? Because the king of kings made it happen. It wasn't me <laughs> that was in control, nor the evangelist. Sometimes we try to make things happen with our own ability, but what we need to do is be a people of integrity. Pray to God who has control and trust God. Jesus makes things happen. Jesus makes things happen. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, meaning to Jesus. Jesus has the authority to take care of all of his children. We need to have the faith to do what we know is right. This is our role, to do what he has told us is right. When we say that we're going to follow God, we should let our yes be yes and our no be no. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Amen? <laughs> Today I want to study some of the life of Joseph, that's Jacob's son, in order to look at how his life exemplified integrity. Joseph started out being quite favored by his father, whose name God changed from Jacob to Israel. Israel. The reasoning was simple. Dad liked Joseph's mom more than the other women that he had married. Hmm. Favoritism certainly is a recipe for disaster. God spoke to Joseph in dreams. Interestingly, the earthly guardian of Jesus, the husband of Mary, God would also speak to in dreams. His name was also Joseph, but not the Joseph of our study today. This Joseph, the son of Jacob, was given a dream where his entire family bowed down to him. <laughs> this may not be the kind of popular thought that you should just run and share with everyone in the family <laughs> when favoritism is already a problem. You're all going to worship me. You're all going to have to bow down before me. No, people don't like to hear that. Joseph was given a dream and not this sort of wisdom, you know, to maybe not share that one with everyone at the time. On one occasion, Joseph went looking for his brothers in a field, and let me read it to you 
from Genesis 37, 18 through 22. But the brothers saw Joseph in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns, you know, a deep hole where they would collect water, right? And say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben, you know, the firstborn, heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So you thought you had problems at home. <laughs> the brothers were actually considering murdering their brother. God is against murder. That is another one of those Ten Commandments. Although Reuben, the oldest of the brothers, had planned to save Joseph, that wasn't God's plan. God had said to Israel's grandfather Abraham, this is Genesis 15, 13 through 14, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not of their own. Of course, we know that means it was Egypt. And they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I, the Lord, will punish the nation, Egypt. They serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. This prophecy that God revealed to Abraham regarding the Exodus, Joseph and his brothers wouldn't. They would have known. I'm sorry. They would have known that. They might not have known how or where, but they would have known of that prophecy. At some point after Grandpa Abraham's death, God was going to move Abraham's family to a country that they would be strangers in. So although Reuben had good intentions, God was setting the stage for this prophecy to be fulfilled. The family would go to Egypt. So the brothers did not kill Joseph, but they did sell him as a slave to slave traders, who in turn sold him to Potiphar, the Egyptian captain of the guard. Now, if you were in Joseph's circumstance, would you honor your commitment to God? When one becomes a Christian, he or she confesses their sin, where they've disobeyed God. They turn away from their sin. This is called repentance. They ask Jesus for forgiveness, because Jesus is the one who paid our punishment for sin by dying on the cross. And then the Christian believes in Jesus. Would you still believe in Jesus if your family sold you into slavery? For many that know Jesus well, the question is silly. What does the sin of your family have to do with Jesus? <laughs> right? However, there are many who have been sold a lie that if you become a Christian, nothing difficult will come your way. Joseph believed in God. In fact, it was God who gave him specific dreams that he was given the spiritual gift to interpret. Joseph believed God, and yet, though no recognizable fault of his own, other than bragging about a dream, he was sold into slavery. However, God's hand was on Joseph. His new slave master, Potiphar, could see that the Lord was with Joseph because Joseph prospered. Let me read to you. This is Genesis 39, 6, the first part. So Potiphar left, Joseph, left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Joseph was blessed by God, even though he was in slavery. Joseph was a gifted administrator. There can be no doubt. Potiphar could see that. Joseph's dad had been grooming Joseph for such a role. But the reason for his success was that the Lord was with him. Now don't think that Satan is going to let God advance the kingdom without pushing back. Don't think that. Let me keep reading. Genesis 39. This is the second half of 6 through 9. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he, Joseph, refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. 
No one is greater, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph was a man of integrity. He can just say no with the best of them. And no means no. You can see that God was able to take a difficult circumstance and bless Joseph. And Joseph's concern was that he would not sin against God. Joseph had not forgotten about God just because he was in the midst of of a very rough trial. In fact, Joseph probably leaned on God more than ever. The idea of committing adultery wasn't going to happen. Joseph was God's man, and that is the way it was going to stay. Now, if God said, thou shalt not commit adultery, Joseph was going to honor God. He also had every intention of remaining trustworthy to his slave master, who had shown Joseph kindness by putting him in charge. However, some would see Potiphar's wife as the perfect crime. They would see opportunity and hope for secrets to remain hidden while they went along with the wishes of a wayward woman. I doubt this was her first time reaching for a stranger in her bed. She just seems too comfortable with, her, with the request. Even given this situation, Joseph's ethics remain unchanged. Let me go on to share with you Genesis 39, 10 through 20. <clears throat> and though Potiphar's wife spoke to Joseph day after day, Joseph refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak, you know, the outer laying of like, like a coat, outer laying of clothing and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants, look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave that you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me? He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now I know what you're thinking, right? Poor Potiphar. Can you blame him for, for wanting to believe his wife? Honestly, the captain of the guard could have lost his temper with a weapon in his hand. Now Joseph has gone from favorite son to slavery and now prison. What did he do wrong? How did he compromise his integrity? He didn't. God had been with him through the whole ordeal. In fact, God was still with him. Still with him. Let me read to you Genesis 39. This is the second half of 20 through 23. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. God continued to bless Joseph in difficult circumstances. His administrative skills continued to flourish wherever he was put. Even after the captain of the guard, Potiphar, brought Joseph to prison, the prison warden still trusted Joseph. It kind of makes a person wonder about Potiphar's reputation, <laughs> or maybe his wife's reputation. Let me continue with this history 
This is Genesis 40, the first four verses. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. And after they had been in custody for some time, you know, what I find interesting is that in one of the world's superpowers of that era, Egypt, Joseph is speaking to people who know the king, also known as Pharaoh. If you recall, the captain of the guard was Potiphar, and even though Potiphar had been upset, he's still working with Joseph. It sounds like an awkward situation for Joseph. Let me continue to read with Genesis 40, verses 5 through 8. Now each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. And when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Joseph can interpret dreams because God enables him to. He recognizes his spiritual ability comes from God. Joseph's faith in God had not wavered in the midst of his trials. He used this opportunity to give this testimony of one of the one and true God to the king's officials by giving the glory to God. Now to everyone, Joseph must have been very different than most people that they knew. Let me read to you about the cupbearer's dream. This is Genesis 40, verses 9 through 15. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream, and he said to him, In my dream I saw a vine in front of me. And on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed. Its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Joseph explained what God had revealed to him about the cupbearer and gave us a few details as to how he felt about the situation. Although God was with him and Joseph kept being put in charge, he wanted out of the prison. He knew that he should not legally be there. Joseph is a man of integrity, after all. Let me continue by reading about the chief baker in uh, Genesis 40. This is 16 through 19 now. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are, again, three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Joseph continues to be a man of integrity. He had just asked a favor of the cupbearer. We know that he wanted to get out of the prison, and Joseph knew the baker wanted Joseph to give him a favorable interpretation, but Joseph will not bear false witness. Joseph tells the truth as a man of integrity should. It did not matter how unpopular the advice was. He also showed enough respect to tell the baker the bad news rather than keep it from him. That was his role. Joseph could not control the situation at all. He clearly recognized that God was in charge as he received the interpretation of the dreams from God. Now I'm sure the next three days were very difficult. One person knows that he's getting out and the other is dreading a painful death. Joseph did not try to be popular, but told the truth. 
As much as Joseph continued to stand by God, the cupbearer forgot to make mention of Joseph to Pharaoh for two years. Joseph remained in prison for two more years for having not done anything wrong. You see, Joseph was blameless. And after those two years, Joseph was called upon to stand before the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. It seemed that Pharaoh had a dream, and the cupbearer spoke of Joseph to the king. Let me read. This is Genesis 41, 15 through 16 to you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you, I've heard it said of you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. From favorite son to slave to imprisonment, and now Joseph was to appear before one of the most powerful men in the known world. This kind of thing only happens when God makes it happen. God had planned all along to bring Joseph before Pharaoh, where God's man Joseph would testify about God. Joseph is quick to say that his spiritual gift is not in his own ability. It comes from God. God is the one that gives the interpretation. God is the one who will reveal to Pharaoh his dream. Joseph always stood by God and did not take the opportunity to elevate himself. As one reads the rest of this history, God reveals that there will be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. Pharaoh is advised to store up his abundance in order to survive the second period of seven years. Joseph reveals the problem from God and the answer. God keeps his hand firmly upon Joseph throughout the situation. You see, Joseph was faithful with smaller things and was found full of integrity. And so God put him in charge of larger things. Let me finish this history this morning by reading to you Genesis 41. This is verses 38 through 42. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man, Joseph, one in whom the Spirit of God, one in whom is the Spirit of God. The Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I, <clears throat> will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took his signet ring off his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And of course, the signet ring had a stamp. It was the king's stamp. It was like his signature. It's like he could sign for the king. God wants people of integrity who glorify him. He will be with them and reward them wherever they are taken. Joseph told the truth as God told him. He went from favorite son of a family to running one of the most powerful nations on earth as sort of a prime minister. How does a slave become prime minister? It only happens when God's hand is upon such a person. All along, God was bringing Abraham's family, the children of Israel, to Egypt to survive the coming famine. It seemed as if nothing good could happen to Joseph, but God was at work the entire time, saving all the people that Joseph loved. Without understanding what God was up to, Joseph continued to testify about his belief and the power that comes from God. When given the opportunity to make something happen for himself, Joseph walked in step with the Lord, rather than attempt to take matters into his own hands. Joseph suffered, but seemed to have the wisdom that King Solomon would later write down in Proverbs 10.9. Solomon wrote, The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. It was good that Joseph stayed with God. He didn't veer from God's narrow path to adultery or attempt to grasp popularity by claiming false witness. God took care of his man as God will for you. Or me, so long as we are people of integrity. You know, Joseph is not the only biblical example of integrity in the Bible. Jesus also displayed this virtue. Jesus' inner life of devotion to God and his outer life of action were consistent. 
And the crowds recognized it. This is apparent from Mark 12, 14a. It says, they, this would be the Pharisees and followers of King Herod, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. This is the first point I want to give you today. When we teach God's way truthfully, we don't allow any cultural influences, any other cultural influences, whether it is people or their ideas, we see that a person of integrity is a whole person. He or she is not different in one situation from another. Their beliefs are apparent in their testimony from the way that they live life. Jesus also demonstrates integrity in Matthew 5, 37, when he says, simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Second point I want to give you. Jesus teaches us that the person of integrity is a reliable person. If you commit to a promise, you should be faithful. This is true regardless of who you make the promise to. Because it's not about them, it's about you. However, if you make a promise to God, you had better keep it. God takes you at your word. Sometimes I'll run into a person who's always trying to make me promise to do what they want. Following Jesus' logic, we should be clear about what we believe is possible for us to do and what is not. There should be no need to make a promise if we give our word. If we say that we will be somewhere, then we should be somewhere. If we are not, then everyone should pray because something went wrong. Third point, a third teaching that Jesus teaches that our actions should reflect our beliefs. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, meaning Jesus, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Acknowledging truth is not the same as acting on that truth. If we really believe that Jesus is the Lord, then we will do the will of God the Father. To say that we believe Jesus is Lord or King and not live that way is hypocrisy. It is the very opposite of integrity. If we say it, we should do it. One of the beautiful things about the story of Joseph is that we can see it from beginning all the way to the end. We saw that Joseph was a finisher. He stuck with God all of his life and even made plans for his burial with God's promises in mind. Genesis 50, 25 through 26, this is explained. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath, make a promise, and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry up my bones to the promised land to Israel. From this place, meaning Egypt. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, that's right, they mummified him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. The faith of Joseph extended to the very end. He knew that there would be a time for family to return to the land that God had promised Abraham. And he made provisions even after the time of his death. Joseph finished the race of life with integrity before God. In the New Testament, we have another example of a person who was a finisher of the race of life. His name is Paul. Near the end of his life, he wrote in a letter to his adopted son in the faith, Timothy. I, Paul, have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul fought the good fight. Life is a fight at times, isn't it? We are involved in a mental battle all the time to keep our head in the game and not check out of what God has asked each one of us to do. It would be easier not to fight. It would be easier to stand on the sidelines and just go with the flow. It would be easier to allow ourselves to be distracted by the many forms of entertainment from the world. It would be easier to tell someone to step up. It would be easier. But would it be something that we can keep our integrity and pass by. We need to be a people 
that does not lose sight of loving God and loving one another. We need to be a people who are always ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us. We need to be a people who are looking for ways to show the love of God to the unsuspecting and hopeless. We need to understand that we are not saved by good works. However, we are saved by faith through grace, and our faith will produce fruit in the form of good works. There are some people who sit back and take inventory of their lives and don't feel like they have many good works. They pretty much have focused on themselves rather than on others. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to fight the good fight, to get involved, to live the gospel of Jesus Christ and not just acknowledge it as truth. The good news is that we are a people. We are a church. You do not have to do good works alone. In fact, I would advise that you do not. I would advise that you always work with at least one other person. The fact is that Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs. Paul also said that he finished the race. He had the goal to finish well. The obstacles or trials in his life only brought him closer to the Lord, just like Joseph. Why is that? He had an intimate, close relationship with God. He trusted him. He knew that there was a fight that was going on over men's souls. He knew that sin was active in leading people to death. In the same way, Paul knew that he would suffer opposition like Joseph. The assumption had to be that God had allowed the trial in his life to bring more people into the kingdom of God. It is true that many people seem to assume that God gives us trials in order for us to learn something. However, God might not be trying to teach you anything. He might be using you to teach others. Or in the case of Joseph, God was positioning Joseph to save the family of Israel, as God had promised Israel's grandfather Abraham that he would. Our role is to trust God and keep our commitments to him. If we say that we believe that Jesus is God and that he is our king, then we should work as Paul did to finish and not just get started. God loves us right now. However, the real rewards that God wants to share with us are still to come. When God sets all things right, when he separates those who want Jesus as their Lord from those who don't, we will have eternity to celebrate the goodness and grace of our Lord Jesus. We have blessings coming to us that we cannot even imagine. However we, however, we need to remember that our time here and now is not that time. We are in a fight, and we should fight for God until our time is finished. Paul also kept the faith. He kept God's trust. Paul said yes to God, and he went to work. Did Paul have a past? Of course. Don't we all? However, that is not what we should be looking toward. We should be looking ahead. We should be looking forward with a thankful attitude that Jesus has made peace, peace with us and our past. The person that we were is not who we are becoming. The closer we walk with God, the better we become. In truth, the closer we walk with God, the more we like ourselves because we can see God's hand on our shoulder. God wants people of integrity who live holy lives. God wants us to be trustworthy to each other, the church, and be trustworthy to God. Should we practice what we preach? Of course. Just remember that we should not shy from preaching with our actions. We should, test, we should be testifying to the whole world in how we live our lives who we are spending time with, and what our goals are. We should not avoid serving with good works so that we can avoid being trusted by our friends in the church, <laughs> trying to get out of doing something. Once you started on the narrow road of Christianity, don't go looking for an exit ramp. Don't do it. Get involved. Keep your focus. Run the race of life well. And be a finisher. In truth, when we know that we are at the center of God's will, 
Loving people and having good works just happens. Let me say it again. Loving people and having good works just happens. We should make a bumper sticker that says something like that. <laughs> just happens. It isn't something that you have to try to do. It is the person that God will make you to be. If we align our will with God's will, then it won't matter what trial or trouble gets thrown at us. We will take joy in the fact that we are people of integrity. We will have peace that we are on God's team. We will seek to finish the race of life well. Our yes will always be yes to God. And wherever we have come from, whatever we have come through, this will be used by God to make us all successful in the kingdom of God at the finish line. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for Joseph. Thank you that he was a man of integrity. It can be so hard for us to trust you, God, when it seems like everything isn't going in our favor. But Joseph trusted you always. He trusted you when he had the opportunity to move vertically on the social ladder too. Yet Joseph never left you. Joseph never forgot you. He is a clear example of what it means for us to let our yes be yes and our no be no. God, would you help us to be a people of integrity? As much as the world seems to enjoy calling us hypocrites, would you see to it that it is not true of us? Thank you that you are purifying us and making us better, holier all the time. May we lift, lift up our lives to you, God. May we live out our promises to one another and have mercy on those who are progressing that is working on being a people of integrity. We know you do it, God. Can you help us to give mercy to those in progress as well? So often, people seem to reach to you, God, when they are in dire need, when it seems hopeless. They know they're dependent on you. They know that you are all that they truly have. Would you help us to be just as mindful of our dependence on you, that you are the one in control when we have much, when everything seems to be going in our favor. Truthfully, everything that we have comes from you. You have given us the ability and the opportunity to work for you. May we be faithful as a people. May we be a people of integrity in every season, to testify of who Jesus Christ is and how we are a thankful people because Jesus saved us. Amen. Amen.